Hello and welcome to History 342. Today I want to talk about the American occupation of Japan following World War II. A quick note, which I could make sort of every single video, which is that it's tough. You know, I, I had this initial dream of making multiple videos per class and everything else, but making them and editing them was enormously time consuming to the point where I don't think I could physically have done it while also actually, you know, doing other aspects of my job, such as talking to you guys. So there's a lot we kind of miss out on. So for example, I'll talk about the constitution for a couple of minutes in this video, the Japanese constitution. And we might have spent quite a lot of time in class discussing that, in particular having you guys discuss it with each other. So how to resolve that issue has been a challenge this term. There's things that I maybe would have liked to have done. Um, but I didn't want to overburden people. Um, and I know from experience in other classes in, in less stressful times that introducing new technological ideas can create kind of challenges. So um, as with every video I'm making and every bit of content we're looking at and every piece of reading that you're doing and every assignment that you have to do, please, please, please feel very comfortable reaching out to me. I will do a face-to-face -face meeting over Zoom and, and we, can, we can chat about stuff and we can figure stuff out. I don't know if it's coming through on the mic, but my children are currently, um, I don't know what they're doing, but they're extremely loud. So I don't know if you can hear it. I should edit this out, but I probably won't. So American occupation of Japan from 1945 onwards. I, I'm going to focus mostly on kind of two key aspects of the American occupation. One, what's called the reverse course, um, which is a major change in the American attitude to how politics in Japan should be working, um, and a major change in kind of as a result in course in Japanese politics, which both helps us understand the decades that follow, but also highlights for us just how just the kind of role that the Americans had adopted and the centrality of Americans in Japanese politics in, in practical terms. And then I also want to talk a little bit about the new political order that emerges as, as a result of that, which is kind of a pro-American order, but not as, how do I put it, um, but not as um, unquestioning as perhaps you might assume. In fact, this new political order is largely a conservative one. And right up until today, the current leader of Japan, Shinzo Abe, you know, his, his grandfather was a major figure in Japanese politics. And, and Abe has very clear links to very conservative elements and angles um, of Japanese politics. And that goes back all the way to uh, the American occupation and that you have this kind of coalition of uh, the American occupation and a very specific type of Japanese conservative elite that really kind of shapes Japanese politics in the decades that follow. I should stress, however, at this point, that Japan, not only does it continue to be a democratic society, it becomes arguably a more, well, it does become a more democratic society because women get the vote. So every, all adults, um, all, adult, all adults can vote. And so it does become, in practical purposes, becomes more democratic. And it should also be understood that although uh, this new order is effectively the beginning of a long-standing kind of conservative dominance, of Japanese politics, that they have, that those groups have reached that through the ballot box, that they have, they have received the votes of enough Japanese people to make it happen. There's been a little bit of a clever manipulation of, uh, of, uh, of, um, I wouldn't call it gerrymandering per se, but of kind of voting totals and stuff, or, or voting boundaries, I should say, not totals. Um, but, but there's, there, there's a tradition that is kind of basically established here in 45, and it's established with kind of American cooperation. And of course, it's also established in the wake of the reality of, of the militarism in the 1930s, um, despite the fact that although you definitely have political figures who rise to power in the 40s off the back of having been imprisoned by the militarists, you also have people who had worked with the militarists who are um, reformed, I guess you'd call them. The Americans had kind of two large clear goals in the occupied Japan. Um, one was they wanted to reform Japan. They wanted to reform the political system, and they had they had very little qualms with doing this from you know from the top down, as historians would say. So historians in graduate school, in particular, will often talk about top down change versus bottom up change. And top down change is being driven by you know important elites and is maybe includes the feedback or ideas of the mucky mucks like yourself and myself, but are being basically imposed on people from the top. So. The Meiji Restoration is actually a very, very good example of this. So e even though this is kind of language of the restoration of the emperor and realizing the will of the people, yada, 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 and committing to parliament and the constitution and everything, the Meiji Restoration is effectively, you know, three people, well, three people in their immediate, cir immediate inner circles making policies that have massive change in Japanese society. And um, SCAP, the Supreme Command of the Allied Powers, um, the authority that, you know, that is supposedly allied was basically American, 
that is occupying Japan takes this position, we're going to impose things from the top down. And the argument, there's a couple of arguments to it. There's the argument that, well, listen, World War II has devastated Japan um, uh, materially, and people are struggling to recover and struggling to make ends meet. Which, which is a fair point. There's also the point, actually, you know, that, like, listen, we can't, um, although they do end up actually taking lots of political elites that were active in the 1930s, that we can't take these same people on the 40s, so we're going to have to impose things and choose our own people. And there's an additional, sometimes troubling cultural level to it. Um, MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, um, a major war hero on the American side in World War II, is effectively given Japan and told, you know, make this happen. And, you know, Dower's book talks about him taking kind of a napkin and writing down the three things he wants and everything else. And, you know, part of this was definitely kind of culturally, even racially driven. Um, MacArthur would later on, you know, tell American Congress he would talk about the Japanese as younger brothers and use this kind of language that actually upset lots of Japanese people because MacArthur was very, very popular in Japan. Uh, but I think it's also fair to, uh, to acknowledge that was kind of MacArthur's personality. MacArthur treated a lot of white people like that too. Uh, MacArthur tried to treat tried to treat President Truman like that. So so you know this was, you know if you're putting Douglas MacArthur in charge of an organization occupying an entire country, he's going to do it the MacArthur way, which is he's going to decide on what's right. And he's just going to do it, um, and you know it's his way or the highway, and the highway isn't actually an option. Like that that's just kind of the way MacArthur was. So so this idea you know so SCAF was going to be imposing things from the top. And on top of all that, then you had this really interesting goal right from the start, which was a, 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 a desire to eliminate the will to war in the Japanese state or the Japanese people. It kind of depended who you were reading or how that was kind of framed and everything else. But this idea that Japan would never again be a warmongering state or a state that would reach out and try and conquer the rest of the world. And this is to a large extent congruent with the kind of conversations that are happening all over the world after World War II. There's this idea that we should renounce um, war, right? And and because World War II, had, World War II scared everybody. I mean, World War II killed millions upon millions of people. It it devastated every country in the world. And 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 in Japan, it ended with the use of nuclear weapons that we didn't know just yet, but would find out soon in the years to follow that if those weapons were used, you know, irresponsibly, that all life on the planet Earth could actually could actually end. Certainly, kind of the next generation of atomic weaponry. So there's this, there's this, there's this discussion in the world after World War II that the will to war must be eradicated. And there's a validating judgment in there as well, which is, well, the Americans and the British and all these Enlightenment Western societies, we never want to war. You know, we 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 we, we stepped in when it was necessary to take on Hitler and to take on the Japanese fascist leaders, not the Japanese people themselves. And that you know, when we were called upon. You know, we picked up our sword reluctantly, we went to war, and now we get to come back and do the things we care about, like having, you know, open government systems or whatever it is, you know, the West believes about itself at this point. Whereas the sense that the Japanese and the, and the Nazis and the Italians and all these countries, that there was some kind of an inbuilt problem there, that something had gone wrong in the system. So remember, you know, you know Japan, um, for many Westerners only a couple of decades earlier, had been the model example that this was a system, right? That you could apply this, that you could make a modern country and that a modern country would inherently be peaceful and would care about the rule of law and everything else. If something had gone wrong, and this is one of the reasons this kind of fascist narrative is very appealing to Westerners. There's this sense that, um, you know, it can be regained and, 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 and there's a huge incentive to view the militarism of the 30s and the early 40s as kind of a blip. And there's also... A, a weird and sometimes unpleasant kind of cultural reading as well, and we'll get into this with the war crimes discussion um, in the next in the next video. Um, challenges of how to treat the emperor as an idea and how to treat kind of Japanese political institutions as cultural institutions and not just political institutions, and it goes on like this. So, so SCAP is kind of put on charge of all of this, and, and what are they going to do? The top-down change reforms largely focused on the concepts of demilitarization and democratization. So removing not just the will to war, but the capacity for war and to introduce democracy. So you have um, Douglas MacArthur effectively just grants the vote to women. Of course, Japanese women have been agitating and fighting for this vote for decades at this point. There's a very, very important Japanese context to that. Um, going back, of course, Japanese women had been part of the reforms that brought in universal male suffrage in 1925, and women had continued to be activists. Of course, this was very hard to do in the 1930s because being an activist of any type was very, very hard. To, 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 it was very hard, you know, thing to be 
in the 1930s. So there was definitely a Japanese background to this, but MacArthur effectively kind of waves a magic wand almost and just kind of like makes it happen, you know, um, as, at least in the eyes of many Japanese. In fact, it's colloquially known as MacArthur's vote uh, in Japan at the time. The MacArthur kind of granted this to people. Um, and there's a huge amount, um, and Dower goes into this in, in his book, in Embracing Defeat, there's a huge amount of enthusiasm for MacArthur. Some might even describe it as gratitude towards MacArthur. MacArthur certainly sees it that way. Gratitude towards him in his capacity as the supreme commander of the Allied powers, but gratitude towards him personally. He's seen as this kind of personal savior almost to the Japanese. And one of the fascinating elements, I would argue, of Japan at this point in the late 1940s is the extent to which kind of everybody immediately buys into at the same time the narrative that well there was a small group of militarists and they were bad and they made things bad and they were difficult um, and and they were and they were morally incorrect and 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 some of us were misled by them most of us were silenced by them and and at risk to our own personal safety couldn't say anything and thank God the Americans are here and now some kind of normality is being restored that's a good story for everybody you know it's a good story for everybody and you this notion of kind of you know um freedom and democracy coming down from the heavens you know uh, um like you know this is this is literally a phrase that's used in kind of cartoons of the time and and this is kind of how the americans are being treated so it's a really fascinating moment because of course the americans are the conquerors but the vast majority of the japanese populace not, a, not every japanese person but the vast majority of the japanese populace has transitioned very quickly from the notion of the Americans as antagonists and conquerors to almost the Americans as saviors. It's kind of, well, the war is over and that was a terrible thing. And the men who waged that war were evil men and now they're gone and we're very glad for that. And now we can get on with being a functioning country again. Um, it's, it's really, it's quite fascinating. You know, MacArthur himself cuts this very imposing figure. There's this famous picture of him standing beside Emperor Hirohito or Hirohito, who was kind of a, quiet man anyway and kind of a docile you know man even as a young man was not an imposing personality um through you know the the the, the volume of his voice or a gregarious nature macarthur was all those things and he was physically larger than hirohito and so this famous picture where macarthur's kind of you know towering over hirohito and it kind of it's a really fascinating and um depending on your point of view almost chilling uh kind of um you know, emphatic confirmation of, of the dynamic of the time. A dynamic that many Japanese, you know, seemed okay with. Um, MacArthur, for his part, had no interest in removing the emperorship at all. Um, the emperor is not um, indicted as a war criminal. We'll talk about that more in the next video. And MacArthur actually saw the emperor position as central to his goal of kind of rebuilding Japan. Again, sometimes building on perhaps not terribly, you know, culturally acceptable models. In the initial years of the occupation, the Americans were kind of, were very interested in building coalitions among various different kinds of Japanese political constituencies. This dramatically changes um, in the late 1940s. In February 1947, SCAP um, thwarts what was a planned general strike. Um, general strikes, very common in Western Europe up until this day. In a general strike, everybody strikes. Um, for whatever the issue is, particularly public sector workers and everything else. So effectively, you know, France has this problem all the time. The truck drivers and mail carriers and civil servants and all these different union members, all the major unions announced were all on strike so that this one union can have its discussion um, with the government or, or whomever, um, with usually the government. And so this is this is going to happen in Japan. And SCAP says, no, we don't want that to happen. In 1948, MacArthur goes ahead and just revokes the right of um, public employees to strike. And throughout 1949 and 1950, about 11,000 Japanese people are removed from public sector jobs, um, with another 10,000 being removed from the private sector after the Korean War. And they're removed because they're basically seen as being sympathetic to communism. Now, the Japanese Communist Party, which had suffered very, very badly in the 1930s, the Japanese militarists hated the Japanese Communist Party. And the Japanese Communist Party had arguably the finest kind of anti-fascist credentials. In fact, they did have the finest anti-fascist credentials of any constituency in post-war Japan um, and drew very large crowds and, and, and were very, very popular. Um, and the Americans, joined by a certain type of uh, elite uh, conservative Japanese political actor, uh, put a stop to that. Why did they put a stop to it? Well, you know, in 1945, the Soviets and the Americans were allies. And by 1950, the Soviets and Americans were very, very clearly antagonists. So what we now see is the Cold War. The Cold War is sometimes dated as beginning in 1948 with the Berlin airlift. Certainly you see this, what's called the reverse course in American um, policy 
in Japan is driven largely by uh, these geopolitical goals and the sense that, listen, Japanese Communist Party, of course, by definition, will do what the Soviets asked them to do. And so if the Soviets try and turn Japan against the United States or create a new Japanese Communist independent state, that's a real problem for us. As the reverse course is kind of brewing, the Americans have been very closely involved with local Japanese elites in writing up a new constitution. Um, the Americans had a very, very active role in this, and Dower's writing on this in particular is very, very useful. In fact, in some cases, effectively giving Japanese lawmakers drafts to more or less kind of rubber stamp. Now, it was never quite that simple, and there's a lot of kind of back and forth between certain constituencies and the Americans. In fact, even the extensive drafting by the American forces before being handed to the Japanese were themselves influenced by this, a certain kind of Japanese uh, political figure that had the ear of MacArthur and other Americans. And these, this imperial figure, they tended to be conservative, they tended to be uh, very much pro-emperor, um, and they kind of had, they had a view of Japanese society and Japanese political culture that dovetailed with MacArthur's. Now MacArthur's was largely influenced by sometimes a rather unfortunate um, patronizing kind of element. Obviously the Japanese don't have this, you know, towards their fellow Japanese, at least not on a racial basis. But certainly there was a type of conservative Japanese who worried about what would happen, you know, if your average kind of, you know, hoi polloi type of Japanese person got to be involved in deciding policy. Now still a major sticking point in the constitution was Article 9. Article 9 is the most famous, um, what's, what's the one I talk about the most at least, the most famous article in the constitution. And Article 9 is the article that uh, clarifies that Japan is not allowed to wage war. The, the constitution, it's constitutionally impossible for the Japanese government to declare war and the Japanese can in fact not even have an army. And this is kind of a major dramatic moment and probably, probably the best example of just how big a role the Americans had um, and, and also a sense of like the vision for Japan that they're kind of building. There's, there's a vision for Japan, particularly as the Cold War is heating up, that Japan is going to be an economic partner for the United States, that Japan is going to be a big ally for the United States in East Asia. Um, the Korean War is used as an opportunity to greatly inflate or to support, I should say, the Japanese economy. Many, many orders of munitions and so on are actually routed through Japan um, on their way to Korea for the United States to generate more um, factory jobs in Japan and create more income for Japanese companies. And there's this idea, initially there's this idea that Japan will be the warehouse of Asia, that Japan will be kind of what China is now in our, in our global economy right now, but in, you know, producing all these goods being used by the rest of the world. Although in this case, the late 1940s would be being produced by the rest of the free world, right? The Western world, as opposed to kind of the, you know, the communist encroachment. In the 1940s, of course, there's this belief that, you know, Soviets, the Chinese, North Vietnamese, North Koreans, all these different groups, they're all communists, they're all, they all agree with each other perfectly, there's no way to split them, no way to divide them, and they all want to undermine us and defeat us through revolution. Which in defense of the Americans and other Western powers, the communists were saying constantly. So th this, is, this is a lot of what's behind this kind of, um, this purging of, of people suspected of communist sympathy um, from public sector jobs and, and the clamping down of the Japanese Communist Party and everything else is being driven by this fear of them of them working secretly to underwell or sorry undermine and destroy these otherwise US friendly states. So that also kind of pushes the Americans towards supporting again these conservatives that I talk about, people like Yoshida Shigeru, who comes in to lead a majority government in nineteen forty nine. In nineteen fifty five the formation of what's called the Liberal Democratic Party or the LDP. Until today, since nineteen fifty five, the LDP has been in power for all but six or seven years, something like that. It's really it's been an astonishing run of electoral dominance. It also sees the return of a wartime elite. A lot of the guys who come back um, maybe theoretically should have been war criminals, but that's a, that's a tricky thing. And we'll talk about that tricky thing next time. Now, discussion questions. Um, the discussion question for this particular video is this. Considering how heavy-handed SCAP could be and also some of the cultural kind of perspectives of MacArthur himself, why does the Japanese public accept such a Central American role in the formation of their post-war political reality? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. See you soon.